Welcome to Tech Talk. My name is Nana Luise Linde. I'm Vice President for European Government Affairs. I'm here today with Tom Burt, our Corporate Vice President for Customer Security and Trust. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Tom, you had a very long and interesting career at Microsoft leading up to the role that you have today. Can you tell us a little bit more about what your team does and what's so unique about it? Absolutely. Um, the customer security and trust team has this really wonderful and empowering mission to do what we can to improve the safety and security of the digital ecosystem. And we do that through a number of different teams, but we have the um, digital crimes unit that works to disrupt cybercrime around the world. We have our digital diplomacy team that works with governments and other stakeholders to advocate for enforceable rules of nation state conduct in cyberspace. We do cybersecurity policy work and we have the Microsoft Threat Analysis Center that works to analyze nation states use of cyber weapons as well as influence operations and how they use those to extend their power and influence outside their borders to impact um, uh, other countries and citizens of other countries. And the threat landscape, cyber threat landscape is constantly evolving. And uh, AI has come into the play as a powerful tool to help address some of these challenges, but also as a weapon for bad actors. How do you see the role of AI evolving in that context? I'm excited about the role of AI, but of course you have to be cautiously excited. And the reason I say that is obviously AI, because it's going to be such a powerful tool, it is now and it will continue to evolve, we can see adversaries taking advantage of, of the impact of AI to do their work more effectively. But what we're seeing today really is um, the adversaries are using AI mostly to help them generate uh, video and audio, so-called deep fakes or synthetic media. And that's the principal way in which we're seeing AI being deployed. We're not seeing AI being used by our adversaries to create some new form of cyber weapon or some other new scary way of attacking um, uh, others, but we are seeing it being used in, that, in the influence operation space. But the reason that I'm optimistic is I really feel confident that we are going to be able to, over time, use AI to give the defenders a disproportionate advantage. We should be able to build algorithms that take the data that Microsoft especially sees across our broad ecosystem that goes from endpoints to cloud services and everything in between. And we should be able to build into that uh, and train against that data set um, AI algorithms that are going to be recognizing malign code or um, concerning conduct online and, and protect our customers automatically with the power of AI. We're already seeing us do that. We saw it work really well um, to protect one of our customers, our defender for endpoint customers in Ukraine at the beginning of the war. And AI detected a Russian wiper package and, and blocked it from being effective to, to impact that customer. And that's just the beginning of what our security engineering teams are going to be able to do. So I feel really optimistic that in the coming years, we will see our AI technologies playing a remarkable role in helping defend um, and and protect customers against threats online. The war in Ukraine, it's the first time that we've seen such a large scale cyber and influence strategy. What do you think after two years now, and I know that you've been also very much involved yourself in what Microsoft has, has, has done to help, what's the lessons learned? Well, I think there are a number of lessons learned. Maybe the most important one is the way in which we've seen uh, Russia utilize uh, three different zones of, of threat to, and to do that in a very strategic way. So kinetic weapons, um, but they've coupled that with the deployment of cyber weapons and destructive malware as well as cyber intelligence gathering 
um, capabilities. And then they couple that with their influence operations, sophisticated propaganda. And what we've seen is they've deployed those things together strategically with strategic alignment. Now, some would say they haven't been as impactful or as effective as perhaps we thought they might be with, say, cyber weapons. Um, but they continue to work on it, and they're, they're now deploying new forms of destructive malware that they, they did not have at the beginning of the war. Um, and they're beginning to be you know, more successful at times with those new forms of, of cyber weapons. But more importantly, this is just the beginning of, I think, the future of conflict. Because it, it's showing um, that you can combine these three different aspects of conflict together strategically, and we will undoubtedly see that um, continuously and repeated, repeatedly in the future um, in conflict scenarios between nation states. And we're already seeing that happen. We're seeing it happen with Iran targeting Albania because Albania was harboring a dissident group, the MEK group, and, Al and Iran used both influence operations and cyber, um, destructive cyber operations targeting Albania uh, in retribution for that. Um, we're seeing it obviously being played out in many ways in the Israeli-Hamas uh, war in Gaza. Um, and we're seeing other nation states utilizing cyber um, techniques to prepare for the future, for the potential future conflict. And so all of these, uh, you know, certainly raise concern um, about the extent to which nation states in the future will use cyber domain, and especially both um, in terms of destructive malware and destructive techniques and influence operations in a strategic alignment. And we will undoubtedly see nation states become even more um, uh, adept and therefore more successful in combining those things together in a strategic way. We've also seen in Ukraine attacks on infrastructure. In that context, how important is the efforts from the EU to harmonize rules and uh, get more resilient? And what role does the private sector play in that regard? We're absolutely right. We have seen um, Russia target Ukrainian infrastructure in a number of ways, critical infrastructure and the provision of key services to civilians. Um, and that has been the energy sector, agriculture, water, um, and even communications and media. But we've seen them targeting all of these in an effort to persuade the, the citizens of Ukraine to lose confidence in their government and their government's effort to defend against the, the Russian invasion. Um, <clears throat> and that's not the only place where we've seen that. And we see governments around the world concerned about the extent to which adversaries can use cyber techniques to impact the provision of these critical um, services to civilians as part of, of conflict. The, the work that the EU has done in um, and working on the Cyber Resilience Act has been a, a strong contribution to the future security of the ecosystem. Um, and it's a, a broad ranging new set of, of legislation and the implementing um, rules and regulations that the private sector will need to comply with. It, and it's, a, it's a, 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 an effective means by which government can help ensure greater security and safety for the ecosystem. The private sector needs to ensure that we can comply with that and the other regulations. One of the challenges we have in this space is we're seeing a vast proliferation of legislation and regulation around the world, often in conflict with one another, um, which makes it very challenging for the private sector to comply with these different rules. So we do need um, you know, leaders in this space, like in uh, the EU's work, to, to work to try to drive harmonization globally so that we can actually have an effective um, global regulation because this is technology, whether you're a hyperscale cloud provider like Microsoft or even a much smaller company with a, a great technological innovation, you want to compete globally um, in this, these markets. And so you need to be able to comply globally. So it's a great initial step in 
uh, discharging government's responsibility to help set the guardrails for what is secure and safe software and, um, and services um, development and operations. But we do need that to evolve into a consistent framework that enables safety and security, does not retard innovation, and does not put the thumb on the scale of competition. I think that a global point is, is a very important one. 2024 is the biggest election year in history. Four billion people will be voting. We have the American elections. We have uh, parliamentarian elections in, in Europe, including the European Parliament elections. What can governments and private companies do together to address or to ensure that these elections are without interference from foreign actors and that there is uh, election integrity? You know, I think it's going to be a big challenge for the private and public sectors to help address um, this, this risk um, during the course of this year. But there's a lot we can do, especially if we can work in close partnership between the private and public sectors. And that really means building new forms of strategic collaboration that still don't exist today where we can work together to identify the greatest risks and how to address those risks. You know, what we see in the private sector, what government sees um, can be quite different, but if we can work together to share that um, understanding, then we can better then decide what role is there for the private sector, what role is there for government to address those risks and try to minimize them. There are key things that we can do. Um, we can work together on identifying the ways in which AI might be used, for example, to try to influence the outcome of an election. And that could be done by um, providing, you know, so-called deep fakes or synthetic media that misrepresents the actions or um, positions or uh, otherwise tries to influence by, uh, by convincing the voting public about something that's false and inauthentic about a candidate or a party. Um, and so that's one thing. And the other thing that we need to really be um, uh, aware of and thoughtful about is how to ensure that a foreign power cannot affect the democratic process itself, the voting um, process. And while there's in the past there's been a lot of concern about the extent to which um, cyber uh, tools and weapons could be used to, to influence the counting of the vote and, and to distort counting of the vote, I actually think that's probably a less significant concern today than the ability of nation states to use um, sophisticated cyber-enabled influence operations to try to distort the vote, to convince people, for example, that they don't need to vote today, that the vote's gonna to continue tomorrow for some reason, or to send them to the wrong polling place, or to utilize the wrong approach and technique to vote so their vote isn't counted. And that can actually happen in a way that could influence the outcome of an election. And so that's a place where public and private sectors need to work closely together um, to counter those risks. Microsoft's number one priority is of course to keep our customers safe. And often we see the private sector in the first line of defense. At the same time, we see a rise in cybercrime and bad, bad actors. Can you say something about this challenge and a possible path forward? Well, um, you know, it's especially in terms of cybercrime, there's uh, several things that we're doing. Um, we're working with law enforcement around the globe to try to disrupt the infrastructure that cyber criminals use to conduct cyber uh, enabled crime. Um, they, they have to use um, you know, uh, different forms of, of the, the systems that enable the internet. They have to use different um, technologies and techniques. And if we can identify those and uh, disrupt their ability to use them so that it's much harder to conduct cyber criminal activity, that would be one way that we could reduce cyber crime at scale. And we're also working with the financial community and governments on how we can disrupt the way in which cyber criminals get paid, how the money that they steal gets 
um, ultimately transformed into currency that they can access, how ransom payments that may be made in Bitcoin, for example, how we can track and disrupt that and recapture those, those funds for the victims. Um, we're doing all the, that work. But I think the longer run is, as I mentioned earlier, our ability to utilize AI and AI um, uh, technologies to recognize when cyber criminal activity is underway and stop it in the fabric of the ecosystem before the victim is ever, uh, is ever um, compromised. My last question, when you look at the year of 2024, what do you see on the horizon for cybersecurity? Well, I see 2024 as a year of both huge um, challenge and huge opportunity. The reality is today, the volume of cybercrime, the volume and impact of nation state activity um, is increasing. Um, and so those of us who are defending against those, uh, those threats and trying to make the digital ecosystem a more safe and secure place, we're losing that battle today. Um, and I am concerned that especially, as you point out, with this being such a, an important election year um, and with the rise in the, the amount of money that cyber criminals are able to extract from the system and the actual commercialization of cybercrime, cybercrime as a business, um, which we've seen develop over the last several years, all of these are, are great threats that we need to overcome. And so that's the challenge. But the real opportunity comes from the ability of the private sector and the public sector working together to counter those threats in some of the ways um, that, that we can counter those threats through the deployment of AI, through effective, thoughtful regulation um, by governments of the private sector to ensure that products and services are developed and deployed in a secure way. Um, and uh, and working together in partnership between the public and private sector to advance that common interest of a safe and secure digital ecosystem. I think we've got great opportunity. I think there are a number of things underway, things that we're doing at Microsoft, things that governments are doing, things on, and projects that others in the private sector have uh, underway that show real promise um, of, of achieving greater safety and security. But it's gonna be a challenging, difficult, hard year and I'm hoping that by the time we get to this time next year, we'll look back on 2024 as a real time of transition from losing these battles to winning these battles and getting ahead of the bad guys. Let's hope we'll win that battle. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.